To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Now let's spend some good time on discussion about various amendments in relation to the GST as compared to November 19 exam and May 2020 exam. Chapter wise, I'll tell the amendments. Right, moving forward, first with the discussion of the concept of supply. In supply, where we have section 71C read with schedule 1, which deals with the concept of transactions regarded as supply, even though there is no consideration. In that, fourth point deals with import of services, import of services by a person from a related person or any of his establishment outside India. Earlier, law covered import of services by a taxable person from a related person or any of his establishment outside India in the course or furtherance of business. But now they specified that import of services by a person from a related person or any of his establishment outside India in the course or furtherance of business. In other words, they replace that word taxable person with that word called person. And let me tell you that actually makes a big difference because taxable person means any person registered or liable to be registered. But if we just say a person that can even cover an unregistered person, now what does that mean? Imagine a case where there is an unregistered person, his brother, I repeat one more time, there is an unregistered person, his brother who is basically in US, who is one architect in US and that brother is actually dependent on this guy. When he is dependent, he will be called as related person because we all know that related person also covers members of same family and family defined by section 249 specifies that family is divided into two parts. One, spouse and children. Second, parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters if they are wholly or mainly dependent on the individual. Now let's say for a second, there is an unregistered person in India carrying on business. His brother is in US who is dependent on this person and brother is basically an interior designer. Clear friends? And our unregistered businessman wants to set up a new office premises. For that purpose, he has taken design from his brother in US who is dependent on this person who is technically called as related person for this guy. Correct? Now when he takes that service of interior designing for his office in India, that transaction will be regarded as supply. Earlier, we were never calling this as supply for the reason being that recipient is not a taxable person. But law replaced that word with taxable person with the word known as person. So now the scope of the concept of supply has expanded. So finally, what is covered in 71C last point is import of services by a person from a related person or any of his establishment outside India in the course or furtherance of business. That shall be covered in the concept of supply within the meaning of section 71C read with schedule 1. Yes, my dear friends, moving forward now. Section 71C read with schedule 1 which talks about transaction regarded as supply even though there is no consideration. In that, third point deals with supply of goods by principal to agent is regarded as supply even though there is no consideration, right? Now, let me give a small example so as to get perfect clarity on this point. Let's say for a second, there is one person known as Mr. A who is a principal. Mr. B who is an agent. From A, the principal, goods are moving to B who is an agent. Now, agent will supply the goods to customer on behalf of whom? A. Correct my dear friends? I repeat one more time. There is a person known as A who is a principal, B who is an agent. From A goods are moving to B, then B will supply goods to customer on behalf of principal. Now fundamental fact is very clear that supplies made by agent, we always heard the concept that supplies made by agent on behalf of principal shall be included in the aggregate turnover of agent. Now an interesting point is whenever there is a supply of goods from Mr. A to Mr. B, whether this is a supply or not, otherwise GST will apply or not. The interesting fact you have to observe in this context is that if tomorrow, I repeat one more time, 
if tomorrow B is giving invoice to the customer in B's own name, if B is giving invoice to the customer in B's own name, if B gives invoice to the customer in his own name, then the supply of goods from A to B will be taxable, will definitely be taxable. But if B subsequently issues invoice in the name of A only, then the transfer of goods from A to B shall not be taxable. Otherwise, the key essential element to be kept in mind is that if agent subsequently issues invoice to the customer on the name of agent, then the transfer of goods from principal to agent shall be regarded as supply. But if agent subsequently gives invoice to the customer in the principal name only, then the transfer of goods from principal to agent shall not be regarded as supply. Now in this context, it is important to know how would the tax statement be in case of an del creditary agent? You would have heard this word called del creditary agent. But let me explain that. Del creditary agent is nothing but an agent who will undertake the responsibility of collection of money from customer and hand it over to the principal. So technically, he will undertake the liability for payments. That is where del creditary agent will get a higher commission compared to a normal agent. Clear my dear friends? Now, in context of del creditor agent also, law clearly specifies that if del creditor agent subsequently issues invoice in his own name, then the transfer of goods from principal to the del creditor agent shall be supplied. But if the del creditor agent does not issue invoice in his own name, then the transfer of goods from principal to del creditor agent shall not be regarded as supply. Now, my dear friends, let me tell a wonderful example to get more clarity on this. Let's say for a second, there is one person called Mr. P. Mr. P, who is a principal. One person called Mr. A, who is an agent. Goods are going from P to A. And subsequently, A is giving invoice to the customer in A's own name. When A is giving invoice to the customer in A's own name, tell me my dear friends, is transfer of goods from principal to agent taxable? 100% answer is yes. But my dear friends, this man agent sometimes undertake the responsibility of collection of that amount. So what will happen is if agent is unable to recover from customer, agent will first hand over the money to principal. Agent will first hand over the money to principal but subsequently will recover from the customer along with interest. Now question is about whether that interest will be included in the value of supply of goods or not. For that, the answer is something like this. Let me repeat again with numbers. Imagine a case where principal has sent goods to agent worth 1 lakh. Agent has given to customer for 1 lakh only. But customer did not make payment on time to the agent. So agent gave 1 lakh to the supplier from his own pocket. Clear my dear friends? So agent paid that 1 lakh to the principal from his own pocket. And agent subsequently recovered from the customer 1 lakh 2000 rupees. Extra 2000 he collected. Now question is whether that 2000 will form part of value of supply. They clarified that in case where agent is covered within the scope of schedule 1. In that case that 2000 will form part of value of supply. When I say that word agent is covered within the scope of schedule 1. What does that mean? That means that. Agent is subsequently issuing invoice to the customer in agent's own name. But if agent is subsequently issuing invoice in the principal's own name, then that interest will not form part of value of supply of goods and it shall be regarded as a separate transaction between agent and customer. So friends, couple of more interesting points with regard to the concept of supply and two special issues which are more of clarificatory in nature. Point number one, whether distribution of free samples or gifts is regarded as supply or not. Friends, it is so common and so practical that we keep seeing, especially in pharma industry, that is in medical industry, that pharmaceutical company manufacture free samples and give it to the doctors, they give it to the wholesalers, dealers and all for the purpose of doing marketing for the products. They do that where they give free samples or gifts. Right, my dear friends? Now, first fundamental part to understand is that 
whether we look at 71A or 71B, both the cases, in fact, 71B talks about imports. If you look at 71A, it clearly says supply includes all forms of supply of goods or services or both, such as sale, transfer, barter, exchange, license, rental, lease, or disposal, made or agreed to be made for a consideration by a person in the course or furtherance of business. So in order to call it as supply, there must definitely be a consideration. And if there is no consideration, we will definitely not regard it as supply unless the transaction is covered in 71C, ready with Schedule 1. So it is very important to note that 71C, ready with Schedule 1 covers only four points and there, nowhere they cover the concept of free samples and gifts. So distribution of free samples and gifts cannot be regarded as supply. Next point guys, if you look at a lot of times we go to a shop, for example, there one person called Mr. X, he went to a cloth store, he wanted to buy one shirt, but there is an offer put up there, buy one, get one free. That means if you just pay 1000 rupees for a shirt, you get one more shirt free of cost. Now question is, for that one more shirt which has come free of cost, will GST apply or not? That's a question. That's because when it is supply or not, that's our primary question. Now what they have clarified is that per se, prima facie, if you look at, it appears as if they charge price only for one, other one is given free of cost. But the fundamental fact is very clear that the price of both the goods is being charged only in the price of one product. And they just give a color as if one product is given free. So law clarified that, it is not treated that one product is given free. It is treated that for both of them, price is charged only on one. And that transaction shall be regarded as supply. And the type of supply will be based on the transaction and will be regarded as either composite supply or should be regarded as mixed supply based on the nature of transaction, based on the type of transaction. Friends, another interesting point with regard to the concept of supply one beautiful clarification they have given, that is, we all know that with regard to section 71A, read with schedule 2, there is a clear-cut clarification given that renting of immovable property shall be regarded as service. In this context, one important point to be noted is, they have clarified that transfer of tenancy rights, transfer of what? Tenancy rights shall also be subject to GST because it is regarded as supply. Now, what does that mean? Let me clarify that. Let's say for a second, there are two persons, Ramesh and Suresh. Ramesh has given a property on rent to Suresh at 1 lakh per month. Suresh, he thought, okay, this 1 lakh per month is what I have taken. Let me do something. He thought he will get a better property at lesser rent. And he found one person called Mr. Mahesh who was ready to take that property on rent at a higher price than 1 lakh. So technically, Mr. Suresh will transfer the property rights to another person for a tenancy premium. Correct my dear friends? So basically, when Ramesh gave a property to Suresh, who actually had rights on the property, Suresh had rights on the property, that means nothing but tenancy rights. That tenancy rights is transferred by Suresh to another person. Situation 1. Situation 2, sometimes Ramesh might only tell Suresh, my dear Suresh, kindly please vacate the property, I will give you some amount, please go. That is also called as tenancy premium. So basically that amount is being paid to acquire the tenancy rights. Otherwise, there is a transfer of tenancy rights and it is being clarified that transfer of tenancy rights is regarded as supply and the provisions of GST will apply. Next amendment is in the chapter known as time of supply. In time of supply, one special provision has been introduced to clarify an important aspect. That is, if there is a transfer of development rights or granting of long-term lease by a landlord to the developer, in that case, they clarified that time of supply would arise on the date of issuance of completion certificate or date of first occupation, whichever is earlier. Now, what does that mean? Let me explain that to you, friends. Friends, for example, sir, one person, Mr. X, he has got one open land with him. He gave rights on that land 
to a developer known as Y. Correct? Now, Mr. Y developer will construct flats on that land which both of them will be shared by X and Y. Clear, my dear friends? That is technically called as joint development agreements. So, observe clearly, there is a transfer of development rights by X to Y for which X is getting consideration in the form of constructed flats. Now, law specified that for that particular transaction, time of supply would arise on the date of issuance of completion certificate or date of first occupation, whichever is earlier. Because we all know the fact that if any flats are sold after completion certificate, then GST provisions will not apply. And GST will apply only when the flats are sold prior to completion certificate. Next, my dear friends, we have got a couple of interesting amendments with regard to the chapter known as value of supply. As we all are aware, that section 15.2.8 talks about all taxes, duties, cess, fee charged by supplier from recipient shall form part of value of supply. In this context, one important point is to be noted. What is that? Let me tell you. Friends, let's say there is one Maruti dealer. Maruti dealer is actually selling one car to the customer and the car value is more than 10 lakh rupees. Let me tell you, my dear friends, under income tax law, if there is a sale of car for more than 10 lakh rupees, then the seller is required to collect extra 1% as TCS, which in full form known as tax collected at source. Now, what does that mean? Let me clarify now. Listen very clearly. When there is a seller, that is a Maruti dealer, he is selling car to a customer for 20 lakh rupees, let's say, Apart from 20 lakhs, seller also collects extra 20,000 rupees, that is 1% as TCS, as per income tax law, which stands for tax collected at source. Now, question is all about whether GST will apply on 20 lakhs or 20 lakhs 20,000. It has been very clearly clarified that the provision of GST will apply only on 20 lakhs, but not on 20 lakhs 20,000. That means net effect, what is the meaning? The net effect, the meaning is that the value of TCS collected by supplier from the recipient shall not form part of value of supply. Next important clarification friends, whenever we look at the business of banking, banks many a times appoint business correspondent or business facilitators who will act on behalf of the bank go to the customer, they will try to find out the potential customer and provide services to the customer on behalf of the bank. Now it is very clear that the business facilitator or business correspondents are providing service to the customer on behalf of the bank. So they have clarified that any service provided by business facilitator or business correspondent to the customer on behalf of the bank shall be included in the value of supply of the bank only, but not for facilitator or correspondent. Moving on to the interesting amendments in the chapter of input tax credit. In this particular topic, one important clarification has been given, which goes as under. Imagine a case where there is a person, Mr. A, who is carrying on business. And Mr. A is carrying on business as a sole proprietor and suddenly unexpectedly A has died and the business is taken over by small a. Otherwise, there is a transfer of business by capital A to small a, otherwise to his son on account of death of sole proprietor. Friends, one important point, an interesting point that it is always allowed to transfer of business as a going concern. Now, fact to be noted here is that Section 18, subsection 3 specifies that in case of transfer of business, the unutilized input tax credit can be transferred to the new person. We will definitely call small a as new person for the reason being that we all know that GST registration is state-wise registration and that too it is purely PAN-based. Once PAN will change, definitely person should obtain for a new registration. So section 18.3 read with rule 41 specifies that in case where there is a death of sole proprietor and there is a transfer of business, then the unutilized input tax credit 
shall be transferred from the transferor to the transferee. Next point with regard to input tax credit only, a very beautiful and fantastic concept given by the law which goes as under. Now my dear friends, if you look at a pharmaceutical industry where medicines are being sold, otherwise supplied, their medicines will move from manufacturer to wholesaler, wholesaler to retailer, retailer to consumer. Now in medicines, the most practical problem in medicines is all about the expiry date for every medicine. We all know that every medicine will definitely have an expiry date. Imagine a case where manufacturer has sent some medicines to wholesaler and along with the wholesaler, the medicines are lying with him. After a point of time, some medicines got expired and wholesaler is returning that expired goods to whom sir? Manufacturer. Now law specifies that when wholesaler is returning that medicines to manufacturer, he can either treat the transaction as a fresh supply or wholesaler can straight away give it as a return goods and the manufacturer shall issue a document known as credit notes. That's how it can be done. Now what law is telling is that when manufacturer has sent goods, for example, manufacturer has sent some medicines to the wholesaler, when the wholesaler is returning to the manufacturer, wholesaler can treat it as fresh supply and give a fresh invoice. Or second option is you can just treat it as a return goods and manufacturer can issue a document known as credit notes. But the problem is we all know the fact that for credit note, there is a specific time limit given by the law where the details of credit note should be submitted in the return but not later than return for September month following the end of financial year in which supply is made. So the timelines have to be kept in mind. One interesting point in this context to be kept in mind is something like this. Imagine a case where manufacturer manufactured some medicines, right? When he manufactured some medicines, on that medicine, he would have definitely claimed input tax credit. Let's say some 10 rupees is claimed as input tax credit on some medicines. That medicines are going to wholesaler and that medicines got expired and wholesaler returned that goods to the manufacturer with a fresh invoice. At that point of time, for manufacturer, credit of 15 rupees is being availed by manufacturer. Assume for a second. Now, tomorrow, when manufacturer destroys that expired medicines, then law specifies that credit whatever has been availed should be reversed. And the credit to be reversed is not the credit availed at the time of purchase or manufacture, but credit to be reversed is the credit availed at the time when the goods were returned with a fresh invoice. In other words, in this particular example, the credit to be reversed is not 10 rupees, but it is 15 rupees. Next amendment with regard to chapter of returns, especially in relation to section 48, which deals with the concept of GST practitioner. Earlier, law specified what are all the list of activities which GSTP could perform. Now, the scope of the activities has been enhanced and some more points have been introduced in that list, which goes as under. Furnish information for generation of e bill furnish details of chalan in the prescribed form, file an application for amendment or cancellation of enrollment and file an intubation to pay tax under composition scheme or to withdraw from composition scheme. These are the additional things which a GSTP can perform compared to the earlier points.